exactly on uh, the 15 minutes thank you for the pradeep and next uh, you can go ahead uh, yeah hi everyone uh, so i am kostav i am a graduate student at iit bombay and today i am going to share with you some tricks and techniques using which you can hunt for intermediate marks black hole i would like to start off by showing you this chart which tends to summarize the properties of all the gravitational wave events that have been observed thus far and majority of these events are binary black hole mergers which tends to have a time frequency map such as this they typically last for a few fraction of a second and they sweep through a broad band of frequencies indicating for a fact that all three phases of a binary in spiral namely the adiabatic in spiral phase the merger phase and the ring down phase are visible within the detector bandwidth and detecting such uh, plain gain signal is relatively easy provided the signal itself is loud enough but things take quite a bit of an ugly turn uh, if you have a signal let's say like gw1905.21 at your disposal uh, this signal as some of you might know uh, barely lasted for a fraction of a second and a considerable fraction of the signal to noise ratio came from the merger and the ring down part of the signal but that didn't really prevent the collaboration from reporting it with a false alarm rate of 1 in 4906 years by the way uh, there is a little bit of ambiguity or confusion as to what kind of astrophysical merger process might have resulted in this signal but it is beyond doubt that the merger remnant is an intermediate mass black hole uh, by the way an intermediate mass black hole is simply an obese black hole with masses between 100 and 1 lakh suns so the question is how do we really detect uh, gravitational wave signals that results in the formation of an intermediate mass black hole well to answer that uh, let me start from the very basics uh the basic or the fundamental principle behind all of gravitational wave data analysis is to find a model strain h of t that significantly mimic the signal strain s of t such that the residual which is the data minus the model strain is consistent with the noise process and hence it is really really important to understand the noise process now as the name suggests the noise is a random process meaning that the future values of it are not uniquely determined by its current value but they are rather some samples from some underlying probability distribution Also, a gravitational wave detector have a contribution from a myriad of noise sources, each characterized by its own probability distribution, and hence the resultant noise process is expected to be extremely complicated. Fortunately for us, we can make various simplifying assumptions. For example, we can assume that the noise process is Gaussian. Uh, we can also assume that the noise in the detector is largely uncorrelated if the two detectors are at two different geographical sites, because most noises are of local origin. we can also assume that the detector noise is weisen stationary and we can also assume it to be ergodic meaning that we can swap between time averages and ensemble averages under this set of assumptions one can show that the power spectrum is the quantity which conveys all the information about the statistical properties of the noise and hence we often use it and often misuse it as a proxy for detector sensitivity so this plot out here shows the power spectral density of all of our three gravitational wave detectors as a function of frequency and just based on the depth of the noise well one can immediately say that the volgo detector is the least sensitive detector whereas the ligo livingston beats the ligo hanford detector at frequencies less than 50 hertz uh, by the way i just created this plot using a representative section of o3 data and this continues to be true during the entire duration of o3 analysis which lasted from 1st of april 2019 up until 27 march 20 and 20 enough about noise uh, let me move quickly into signals So personally speaking I like to imagine gravitational wave signals as tiny vibrations which will cause a change in the differential arm length of the detectors and this change in the arm length will cause a change in the fringe pattern which will oscillate following the impinging gravitational wave now if the cause of this vibration is a quasi circular black hole binding then it is ought to be characterized by a set of 15 different parameters which you can broadly differentiate into intrinsic parameters and extrinsic parameters The intrinsic parameters consist of the component mass and the component spin vectors, and they help you tell information about such uh, such as how the waveform will evolve with time, and it will also give you an idea about the uh, waveform morphology. Whereas the extrinsic set of parameters give you an idea about the location of the source, the inclination of the source with respect to the observer, the polarization angles, and the time and phase at the merger. Now. the real problem is that we really don't know the parameters that of the signal that we are hunting for beforehand so we try to create a discrete bank of filter waveforms uh, which uh, we, and uh, and we try to cross correlate the detector data with each of these template waveforms so if one of these uh, gravitational wave detector data which contains a gravitational wave signal let's say 
and if it matches with one of the templates in the template bank then we'll see a peak in the snr time series now the real problem is that at the current epoch it is computationally infeasible to search over a 15 dimensional manifold and therefore we are forced to make a very simplifying assumption namely that we assume that the signal at hand is well described by the dominant modes of a quasi circular non precessing binary and under this assumption one can show that it is sufficient to search over just the component mass and the z component of the dimensionless spin vector so given that how noisy our detectors are uh, you might wonder as to how we can really assert that a given trigger is of astrophysical origin and well to answer that uh, we take clues from general relativity we demand that if a trigger is of astrophysical origin then it must be detected across the detector network with a time delay which is consistent with the light travel time between the detectors and that it must be described by the same best match template we we'll call such triggers as astrophysical triggers or foreground triggers or foreground candidate candidate events and so on and so forth based on our mood and we try to rank them based on the overall loudness within the detector network as a final step we also try to assign them a statistical significance by comparing their rank against those of the background triggers now gravitational wave detectors are kind of omnidirectional and it is really hard to actually seal them from any kind of incoming gravitational wave radiation so we try to manufacture these background triggers and to do so we use a method of time slice which essentially involves sitting the data of one of our favorite detectors with respect to the other by a time delay which is larger than the light travel time between the detectors and then looking for any kind of fake coincidences and then we try to calculate the false alarm rate by comparing the loudness of the background trigger with that of our foreground trigger now if you have been listening carefully to me uh, you might be really wondering as to say how by performing such a restrictive search we can guarantee that we don't miss out on triggers which are of having much more richer physics uh, let's say precession or non zero eccentricity or hell some astrophysical process which produces gravitational waves and intermediate mass black holes and the answer is we really can't bet our lives on that so we try to do better we perform searches which are called as burst searches which are completely agnostic to waveform models these kind of searches are based on the following rationale a uh, gravitational wave signal irrespective of its fine structure uh, be it a chirp or not is expected to be a transient waveform which will create some localized excess in energy in the time frequency plane and this excess in frequency must be seen coherently across the detector network now to obtain this time frequency representation we try to map the time domain data into time frequency domain via the wavelet transform and in particular the coherent wave burst algorithm uses wilson debussy's maya transform which has a unique property of providing with a uniform time frequency grid uh, as compared to other wavelet transform which generally shrink in time as you crank up in frequencies and then we try to rank these kind of triggers by coherently uh, measuring the total amount of energy of the cluster time frequency pixels and then uh, the burst searches also try to assign a statistical significance based on the method of time slides now all of this what i have discussed thus far is really really good or perfect in an ideal world not really in the real world and this is because of gravitational wave detector data is plagued with intermittent uh, noisy transients or glitches which not only affects its stationarity which not only deviates it from gaussianity but it will be also responsible for raising false alarm and it would also significantly affect the background estimation process that we that, that i described a few slides back and this in turn will affect the statistical significance of our of our foreground design so we are forced to use multiple uh, different signal consistency tests and we are also forced to use different signal noise discriminators to punish or penalize this kind of triggers now for the final few minutes that i have i will quickly rush through the o3 imbase results and let me start with some bad news so unfortunately other than gw190521 we failed to apprehend any new confident gravitational wave trigger yeah we actually reported uh, two more triggers but they are of highly questionable origin uh, one of them is actually guaranteed to be a noise trigger where the whereas the other one is so dubious that we have to dedicate an entire appendix for it anyway uh, we actually perform uh, three different searches two of which are coincident template bank based match filter search whereas the other is the burst search and we try to combine the results of these three search by performing a meta analysis or by developing a ghost search which is better than these individual searches 
Now, since we have failed to detect any new gravitational wave triggers, we tried to remeasure the merger rate of GW1905.21. Now, at the current time, we just have one detection, which means we are completely ignorant about the general population distribution of intermediate mass black hole. So we treat this event as the sole representative of a new class of event, which is completely characterized by just the intrinsic parameters. And we try to get these intrinsic parameters from the posterior samples of the parameter estimation analysis that was done on this event. Uh, uh, for extra bit of calculability, we use the inner surrogate samples. And then we try to draw a population distribution out of it by varying the set of extrinsic parameters. Now, based on the fractional recovery of this kind of fake injections that we make onto the gravitational wave data, we try to estimate the merger rate. And we found that uh, the merger rate for GW1905.21 like figures is something like eight mergers per gigapercent cube per 100 years. Yeah, two minutes. Yeah. And we can also cook up uh, further gravitational wave signals. For example, in this case, we use 46 numerical relativity simulations with a varying amount of total mass and having varying amount of mass as well. And we also varied the spin alignment. So some of them were spin aligned to that of the orbital angular momentum. Some were spin anti-aligned to that of the orbital angular momentum, whereas, whereas some of them have spin misaligned to that of the orbital angular momentum, which will lead to precession within the system. And after some thousands of hours of computation, uh, we found that the merger rate keeps on increasing with an increase in mass ratio. And this is simply because the intrinsic loudness of the system drops with an increase in mass ratio or decrease in mass ratio depending on uh, what you prefer. We also saw that uh, with an increase in total mass of the system, the merger rate also increases. And this is simply because the duration of the signal within the detector bandwidth drops. And finally, we also found that the uh, merger rate does not really change if we switch on precession. The only change that we see is that with an increase in the effective spin or chi effective, we found that the duration of the signal within the detector bandwidth increases, and hence the duration improves. Nothing changes if we have spin uh, chi p non zero, which means that we have in plane spin. And we also found, uh, put a stringent upper mass limit of 0 0.06 mergers per giga per cube per 100 years for a system of total mass 200 and having mass ratio equals to one and spins completely aligned to that of the orbital angular momentum. So to conclude, we have just started to scratch the surface and we have just reported the first unambiguous detection of intermediate mass black holes. And we are kind of ignorant about a lot of questions like as to how these kind of sources form, how their population distributions look like, et cetera, et cetera. But the future is bright, uh, given that we are at the turn of the next decade, we'll have third generation detectors and even space-based observatory during which we will be able to perform a multi-band detection of intermediate mass black holes. And we will be able to resolve much of these questions. And the fun thing is we can still continue to use some of the tricks and techniques that I uh, covered hastily today, uh, even during those era. With this, I will pause. And if you have any questions, you can shoot. Thanks. Thank you, Kosto, for the nice talk. Uh, are there questions to Kosto? Okay, maybe I can uh, ask a question. Uh, in terms of the IMBBH, you know, burst searches for IMBBHs, does the mass or the parameters of uh, 190521 happen to be on the lower edge? That is, you know, is that the kind of minimum mass that IMBBH can a search can detect? Uh, because I'm wondering because there were a few hundred plus events in the O1 and O2 and so on which were not detected in the IMBBH search. So definitely, the something like a 150 plus is something um, which will really fall into this search. Is that right? Uh, so you mean uh, that the two triggers that was reported in the sub threshold paper, right? No, so I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I know. Uh, the 19.0602 trigger or 19.0519 trigger. Because okay, yeah, both, of, the, exam, yeah, both yeah. of them were actually detected by the search. So the only threshold that is put in any kind of burst searches is that uh, we actually try to differentiate between two uh, burst searches. One is uh, burst searches looking for total mass greater than 80. And another is a burst search, which is looking for uh, triggers with mass, total mass less than 80. So this 80 threshold is chosen based on simulation campaigns. And it also depends on the Q veto that is used in this kind of burst searches. And then the, what was done during the O3 IMBS results was the results of both this BBA search and this IMBS search was combined. 
to get the out, uh, ultimate output. And if okay. speaker has been really missed out, it is simply because it was not significantly loud or enough to be detected, or just because some of the vetoes ruled out this as a trigger, astrophysical trigger. Uh, for example, to get 25th uh, December trigger. As okay. Yeah, thanks. One more, any quick question from anybody? Okay, I think if not, thanks, uh, Kausu. You can keep you know, asking questions in the chat, I guess Kausu can answer. So thanks, Kausu. Yeah, sure. And 